That'll be fun. Okay, let's get started. So, uh, uh, a couple of announcements. First of all, from uh, our department, the first announcement uh, is that it's the season to start applying for certificates. If you uh, have completed enough classes to get one of our certificates, don't forget that you have to actually apply to get it, which means filling in a form. You can get the form from the department secretary. Uh, and so, you, you know, you fill in the courses you've taken. Um, if the certificate, if the composition of the certificate has changed since you started, let's say you started in 2013, and we changed the composition of almost all of our certificates last year. If you started in 2013, the requirements to get the certificate are still those that you started with in 2013. Those are called catalog rights. So be sure to let everybody you know that you're dealing with that that's the case as you fill in that form or whatever. Um, if you have all of the required courses completed and you got better, you know, you got the requisite grade for the class, you just fill in the form and give it to the department secretary. If you uh, are missing something, then you should talk to our department chair and uh, see if uh, something else that you might done could substitute for it or see just with her what still needs to be done for you to get your certificate, okay? And those have to be done, uh, uh, the deadline is, uh, I wanna say early November, so get it done as soon as possible so you don't have to trust my fuzzy memory about the deadline, <laughs> all right? Okay, the other thing is on Monday, there's Unity Day here on campus, uh, which means that in the quad, there's gonna be a whole bunch of clubs that are out there with tables. Our department will have a table for the broadcast club, which was just recognized yesterday. Um, if you're interested in knowing more about the broadcast club, you should talk to there are other people in the class who are involved or you, that table is there on Unity Day and I'll be an advisor. So, uh, however, Unity Day is for all the clubs uh, put on by the Interclub Council here at City College and uh, also there'll be music provided by uh, one of the students uh, in the broadcasting department. So uh, check out those tables and uh, Apparently, uh, one of the best indicators for academic success is students who actually get involved in clubs. So go figure. Do, doing, doing more on that end can increase your chances to do great on the academic side. So, all right, that's it for our announcements. Um, today, we're going to continue on in our kind of hopscotch around the uh, history of the internet and uh, where, where it is exists uh, right now, I guess. We have uh, uh, things to talk about in terms of privacy and net neutrality. Olive was asking about some of the relevant um, policy that was, uh, um, that, that is, you know, always in the process of changing around different aspects of uh, the internet and internet radio, uh, copyright on the internet, privacy on the internet. And hopefully we'll have a chance to talk briefly about net neutrality as well, which crystallizes uh, some of the challenges that uh, the, uh, the FCC has uh, in terms of, uh, of you know, in, uh, 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 enforcing policy regarding the, uh, the internet. So a whole bunch of things. Uh, quickly to review a few ideas that we got out there last, uh, last class. Um, the idea that uh, Vint Cerf was the father of the internet. Uh, he sort of emerged as the public figure associated with the early days of development of the internet as a packet switched network of computer networks. Um, and as we clarified last time, the internet is distinct from the World Wide Web in the sense that the internet is, we're talking more about the uh, information infrastructure, the actual networked computers that are sending the data around the globe, basically at this point, versus the World Wide Web, which is an application or a, a yeah, it's a, a set of applications that run on that infrastructure and uh, they use um, uh, HTML, the hypertext markup language, as uh, the, the basic format uh, uh, for information display and the TCP IP, the Transfer Pro uh, Protocol, the Internet Protocol, TCP IP altogether, as the computer language of, of 
you know, handshaking on the internet as to, to interface between one computer system and another. So the web running over the infrastructure provided by the internet, but the web just being one of uh, many different ways of, uh, of producing and packaging the information that will go out over the, uh, over, over, over the internet as its infrastructure. Metaphors are coming into mind, but enough with metaphors. There's so many. The information superhighway, all the rest of it. Uh, what's the app that we use in order to surf the web? What's it called? It, I mean, you know, commercially we've got Chrome, we've got Firefox, and stuff. What do we call those? Browsers, right? Browsers. Browsing, right? And we didn't really have time to touch on the, what we call the browser wars, um, but you can look them up. Uh, there's there's plenty on them. I mean, um, just to recap that one. Uh, in the early days of uh, uh, of the web, um, one browser was created by a graduate student named Mark Andreessen in a Midwest University. I can't remember the name of the university right now, uh, but uh, uh, it was called Mosaic. And Mosaic was the first browser, which, as we mentioned last class, pulls together the various uh, files that are uh, all called up by the HTML code, which is the basis of every page on the World Wide Web. And uh, so Mosaic made it uh, uh, a, a standardized uh, procedure for, for generating and pulling together web pages. Um, Mosaic was commercialized as Netscape Explorer. Anybody ever use, you guys are too young, yeah, okay. Some, some folks use Netscape a little bit, yeah. Uh, Netscape, um, the browser wars in, in uh, um, in, in this story that we don't really have time to go into as deeply as we'd like to, but Netscape being the first commercialized browser, uh, I remember in 96, 97, just basically, whoa, you know, here, here's this, here, everyone's using Netscape through several iterations, and soon after, Microsoft started bundling uh, Internet Explorer with their operating system. Uh, and so that was kind of Microsoft retaliating. Microsoft, which had a virtual monopoly in the PC uh, uh, software, software operating system, right? I mean, every, every PC ran on Microsoft Windows, basically. Um, and so, or at first it was MS-DOS, Microsoft Disk Operating System. And then on top of that, in part inspired by the Apple operating system, which was a really minor competitor, uh, was the Windows operating system. And so just about every PC that you bought had Windows on it just to make it work. And so Microsoft had a dominant position in that part of the business. Uh, and then they felt that, well, this, what's, what's happening? We've got network computers and this Netscape upstart is you know, running, running around us. And, and so they very aggressively put Internet Explorer out with every copy of, of Windows that was going out too, which in, um, in Europe was, uh, uh, they had to stop it because they were sued. Governments felt this was uh, uh, like kind of an abuse of a monopoly. Uh, but here in the United States, they were able to continue distributing Explorer with, uh, with every copy of Windows that they shipped. And so uh, that Netscape sort of really declined, you know, from, from being a, a very successful product, it, it tanked, basically. And they gave away the code, which uh, is now, was the basis for Firefox. So if you're using Firefox now, you're using the descendant of, of Netscape. But uh, Firefox is like a, a not-for-profit, so. So that was the browser war, but it's, uh, it's, it's you know, the, the, in the telling of the story, we, we gloss over the accusations and counter-accusations that were made against Microsoft for acting as a, you know, a real monopolist. You know, they were defending themselves, well, we're just putting out another product, you know, it's a good product. And Netscape was saying, well, you're destroying our business and you've got a monopoly position because everyone needs your operating system and you're basically giving them away the identical tool that we're offering. You know? So, so uh, that, that was 
a bit controversial. So it's, it's, it's interesting to see. How long did that last? Well, I think within about three years, the legalities of it were over, but Netscape tanked within, within a year and a half, I think, of, uh, of Internet Explorer coming out. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and I think back in the day, again, you know, it's, it's uh, having lived through that and, and the early, I mean, I, I had the impression at the time that the, 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 the conflict was not over just who would, who would supply your browser, uh, but it was also the notion that whoever supplied your browser uh, would be able to control the content that you were seeing. And it, I mean, if you still look at Bing or, you know, what does it load instantly as its homepage? It's MSN whatever, right? Which is also a Microsoft, you know, portal and promotional tool. So, so at, at the time, which is before Google search, right? It's the time before, you know, search had become a way that people found stuff versus, you know, at the, at the time Yahoo was a big directory uh, and it was actually it was it was it was made by actual people, employees who were cataloging. You know, well, you know, you're working on golf, and so you're going to create pages of links to useful pages of golf stuff. You know, so search was, you know, incredibly uh, limited and manual in the early days of the web, and so I think people viewed, you know, the. The killer app, the way to get the advantage, was possibly in the browser. If everyone was using your browser, you could set it up so that they had easier access to the information you wanted them to see. But Google blew all of that up because everybody, you know, within a year, I was hearing about Googling, uh, and everyone switched over to Google as a search engine because it was so much more uh, uh, useful in terms of, of leading you to content. And at that point, what browser you were using didn't seem to be that important because you could use Google to go to wherever you wanted to go. You know. And then years later, people started talking about the Google algorithm as perhaps directing people you know, too much towards one type of information or another. So, uh, so there's, you know, that, I guess the worries about the browser as being, uh, uh, you know, too effective a funnel for people's uh, uh, internet experience were kind of undone by browsing, by, by, uh, by search. And now search is kind of undone by social media. You know? So now it's kind of like, are people, are people using search to find stuff or are they going on recommendations and, and links that they get through social media? You know? so it's, it's, and it seems like right now a big issue is, is um, Facebook being able to control where you're going and what you're seeing, um, in a sense, not not that it's involuntary that you have no choice, but it's just that if that's where you go all the time, if that's where you spend all your time, that's your preference. But then you're working within the universe they provide. So, you know, these are interesting stuff. Yeah. When, okay. when you have a chance, Jenny posted something in chat. For oh, you. thank you, thank you. Okay, yeah. Let's let's look at chat here. And thank you for moderating. <laughs> uh, and where were we? Here we go. Chat. Here we go. Mm, okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Jenny, for working on your contact at, at YouTube for us. Wonderful. Okay. Wait. Contacting YouTube. Well, Jenny was going to invite That's someone to come and speak speak with us uh, oh. or to us, someone from YouTube to speak to us about what she does there. Gotcha. Okay, and another important concept we touched on before was uh, last class was uh, bandwidth. It controls the speed and the amount of data that can travel across the network. So where we immediately experienced that as end users, we talked about the dial-up modem speeds that initially sort of limited the web to text-based materials. But when we got into broadband, what's called broadband, which is a broader bandwidth, more data can be sent uh, through the internet and that um, allows audio and visual uh, applications and streaming to happen as well. So, 
when enough of the population gets a hold of that uh, broadband connection, then um, uh, <clears throat> you can get a multimedia web and, uh, and get what we get now, which is all kinds of stuff delivered that way. <coughs> awesome. OK, so those were some important ideas that we talked about uh, last class. Given that we have broadband now and we can use the web for multimedia, uh, both streaming and downloads. We, so we talked about uh, internet. Well, the provision of audio over the internet in the early days of uh, file sharing, um, which were pretty disastrous for the, uh, the music industry. We talked about Napster, the downfall of Napster. Um, and you know, I, I think, again, in, um, in popular lore, everyone's aware of uh, the coup that Apple pulled off by uh, moving from being a you know, hardware software manufacturer into a, a music and video distributor with iTunes, uh, where the, you know, the rest of the music industry was caught napping, if you want. Uh, and so that's uh, um, something that uh, they vowed not to allow to happen with, with video. Uh, but uh, I think, again, Netflix, as an outsider, uh, pulled off something of the same coup uh, as, as being, you know, uh, outside of the typical studio distribution system, uh, a DVD mail order type of business all of a sudden becomes the premier streaming uh, service and a big competitor to HBO finally. So uh, quite, quite a business success. So another story of an outsider coming in and and uh, making an end run around the established uh, uh, interests that were there. Um, internet radio today remains, uh, um, well, there's a certain amount of controversy around internet radio um, in that uh, uh, terrestrial radio typically uh, paid 10% of its profits uh, to the rights collection agencies, ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. And there's a new one that's just started up G GMB, something like that. Anybody know it? Uh, so those are, those are uh, entities that uh, some of them have a long history. I mean, they basically collect royalties from broadcasters uh, to, and redistribute them to, uh, in the case of these, the, the composers of the songs that are played. Uh, so terrestrial radio had a deal dating from way back where uh, they, the, each station will give a, a percentage of their profit, then will provide records to the rights collection agencies who will split the money up and send it out to, uh, to the composers. But performers were not compensated under that initial deal. For most of radio's history, being on the radio as a performer, well, if you were a performer of your own compositions, that meant you would get paid your rights. But also, you know, that was the way that you sold records. And so the idea was that uh, you were compensated enough as a performer uh, by profit you would make from selling your record outside. Well, when all of that came to be renegotiated for digital radio, performers stood up, lobbied, and uh, digital radio, uh, internet radio, has to pay uh, both a composer's uh, license fee and also a performance fee. Uh, so basically, they have to pay more than any terrestrial radio station does. Uh, it comes to about uh, 0.07 cents per song per listener. So that means, again, uh, if you're a radio station, experience significant growth and people are listening to you, uh, you're still just paying based on your, uh, your revenue for that year, right? Uh, if you're an a internet radio station that takes off, every additional listener costs you money on the bottom line. You know, every stream that you're serving costs you, you know, 0 0.07 cents. And so that um, makes it a lot harder for an upstart, you know, internet radio broadcaster to come along and grow in the way that, uh, that, that early radio stations could, you know. So um, this is still an issue that holds back a lot of, I think, a lot of, a lot of small broadcasters would like to get onto the internet radio, but these, these uh, license fees um, stop that. And really, uh, uh, a huge operation like iHeartRadio uh, can uh, make, make separate deals with the big music publishers and, and, uh, um, and you know, recording distributors 
So iHeartRadio can cut a deal with Sony Music uh, where they're not paying anywhere close to 0.07 cents per stream per listener. Uh, but uh, a small internet uh, radio station would have to pay that. So it's, uh, it's difficult for small internet broadcasters. So, so that's, that's a, an issue for, for them for sure. Um, anybody doing any like music on the internet type of thing? We did have a radio station here, and one of our hopes is that the radio club, I mean the, the broadcasting club, might you know um, get, get something like that back. Uh, so we'll keep you posted. But nobody is doing any internet radio. Anybody live 365? Does that is that something anybody's aware of or shoutcast? No? Oh, okay, Th these were. Um, uh, pr prior to the emergence of the rules, uh, it, it's called Sound Exchange is the, um, the entity which is like ASCAP or it's the collection agency that basically gets the money from internet broadcasters and redistributes it to composers and performers. It's called Sound Exchange. And about 2007, 2008, it was created. And, uh, and, and the laws were you know, uh, modified for, to make that. Uh, possible for them to, to ask for those license fees. And uh, ever since then, you know, these, uh, what was it, something like Live 365 used to be able to set you up with your own internet radio station, take care of the rights payments for you and everything, and they've all pretty much disappeared. No one seems to have heard of them anymore. So that's, it's a shame because it, it would let you sit at home and have a radio station, which is kind of cool. Well, we should talk a bit about podcasting. <laughs> Yes. Uh, all right. Podcasting as a uh, an early alternative. Well, I mean, what was it? It's a way of distributing audio programs through podcasting, where, as you all know, you can subscribe to a podcast, and whenever a new episode is released, it can get downloaded to your device. Usually, it's a mobile device now. Podcasting has really had a second life to it uh, now that. Um, most people have a, a, a smartphone or a mobile device which can easily subscribe. So I think there was a first wave of podcasting it was limited because it had to run through your laptop and you would subscribe, files would be downloaded to your laptop, you had to sync it to your mobile device, which was a pain. There was early enthusiasm around podcasting. Then uh, there's been a real second wave and a renaissance as people get into, you, you know, just directly downloading it onto their smartphone whether it's through Stitcher or the Apple podcast app. It's pretty terrific, I think. Uh, it's a, a great complement to radio as well. And uh, um, it's, uh, it, it's, a, uh, it's in contrast to streaming, so there's two, two you know, basic ways that um, this type of information is reaching us, either through podcasting, where you actually download a file, subscribe to on your phone, or whatever. <coughs> And a streaming setup where basically a stream of data is pushed through the internet. So you have to be connected to the internet uh, at the time that you're consuming uh, a streaming signal. Uh, versus podcasting, you may set it up so it, you just download all your podcasts when you're at home on Wi-Fi and then you're out in the street and you don't have to use cellular data uh, to, to play back a podcast. The industry seems to like streaming. Uh, because the industry would rather not put files on your computer that you can easily share afterwards. Um, so the, the preference is to stream stuff so that you, you know, at least have to use another app in order to uh, you know, record the stream and have access to it. And of course that's not a widely distributed app. But pretty cool. So, so there's, there's a whole lot of activity in online audio um, which is uh, you know happening in podcasts, whether they're they're mostly talk podcasts as well. Uh, the reason there's not a lot of music podcasts out there is ASCAP, CSAG, BMI, they they actually have no agreements that cover podcasting. So there there is no kind of infrastructure for licensing music for podcasts. Uh, not the way that you know as a radio broadcaster you can just pay. A percentage of your revenue, and then get access to anything that's out there. Uh, you know, so podcasts to be legal would be sort of a one by one type of agreement made with you know whatever rights holder controls the music you want to use. So uh, that limits the you know just 
you know, putting a lot of music out on podcasts. So they, they tend to be talk and information um, and documentary, a lot of stuff. Uh, audience fragmentation, so you know, you're no longer having to hit a huge, wide audience of a million people uh, with their you know, varied interests. This is, this is the challenge of the broadcaster. You know, you've got one channel, you're trying to appeal to a million people with different, different ideas and interests. So you wind up creating some, you know, what you feel is programming with very broad appeal, you know, situation comedies or something. You can't be too offensive because you'll lose part of your audience that way. Uh, you have to program something that, you know, 60-year-old people will like, but also potentially 20-year-old people or teenagers and stuff. So that really affects the type of programming you do versus, you know, in the new media ecosphere, uh, it's very fragmented. You can narrow cast, you can target your stuff to very specific audiences with very specific tastes. That certainly makes broadcasting a lot more interesting. They talk about, yeah, personal media in the sense that uh, media, your, your media consumption can be tailored to, uh, to what, what you're interested in. I mean, obviously, YouTube is a great example of that. YouTube, the original user-generated video site, which, as we said, ran into early problems uh, with copyright because people, one of the things they wanted to do was just to share clips of their favorite, you know, uh, or television whole, shows, whole right, or whole episodes if you wanted, right? And so, uh, so that led to the, the big Viacom lawsuit. It led to, you know, once Google bought uh, uh, YouTube, they had to, um, create a whole content management system that we were talking about last class and, uh, just to clean that up. And now, of course, they're uh, you know, expanding on what YouTube can do by offering live TV uh, bundles, basically competing with cable television. YouTube Red, so they're offering original programming as well. Uh, again, you know, taking advantage of all the users that have come to their platform once you have a user base who's coming to you often with accounts and stuff like that, you can start trying to do different things. Just as Facebook is trying to provide video, and now Facebook is going into actual original television production put through Facebook. And Apple apparently has like $8 billion set aside to develop uh, television-like programming as well. So, so uh, you know, it's uh, competition within streaming is really taking off. Yeah. So is audience fragmentation going after a smaller portion of the audience? That's right. Uh, absolutely, yeah. So, so the broadcasting model was, you know, if you had only CBS, ABC, NBC, and 30 million people a night nationally were watching, you know, you, those 30 million people, you could, you know, we understood them as, as demographic slices, but we didn't program to those demographic slices. But if you look at you know, what happened to radio and their differentiation of the different stations in, by format, you know, then you could fragment somewhat by playing you know, hip hop music or oldies and you would get different audience slices that way. And on that logic now, when you have limitless channels with internet video, you can fragment even more. So you, know, you can program to uh, you know, technology lovers, or uh, you know a certain sports enthusiast type, and so so yeah, the steady fragmentation uh, has just you know been pushed further and further by. Seems like the exact opposite of old media. Yes, absolutely. You know, it's it's been a real trend. Cable TV, you know, also managed to you know, with by 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 narrowing down the content of a cable network, you could go after smaller slices of of, uh, of audience. So, uh, yeah, so, so that's definitely been a trend, and now it's really extreme, basically, you know, in, in that um, uh, you can see, uh, you can, yeah, I mean, I read an article, I, I should dig it up for you guys. Somebody went, uh, a, a guy named Alexis, um, uh, damn, I can't remember his name, we'll, we'll look up the article, went through the Netflix, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the URLs are the equivalent of the URLs that would come up when he searched something in Netflix. Eventually led him to find out that there were 52,000 genre distinctions that Netflix makes in its, the way that it catalogs its programming. So this is connected to the Netflix suggestion or recommendation engine, right? But it, it 
it, it classified its library into 52,000 categories on the idea that if you liked action movies with Clint Eastwood, it could then serve you up more out of that category and stuff. So, you know, that would probably be the most extreme example of, of fragmentation that I've heard about, you know, splitting your catalog into 52,000 individual kinds of fragments and then, and then recommending that out to people. Now, of course, all of this is, it's gone well beyond what any human being could actually do, right? I mean, nobody could keep track of 52,000 different things. It's, it's all done, you know, algorithmically by analyzing what are the requests that people are making and, and you know, so, so that's, the, the, that's the, the, the technology that's more and more, you know, useful at creating extreme, uh, extreme fragmentation and, and understanding like how people are using it. I wish I could make it more coherent, but <laughs> it, it seems to me a very complex, you know, infrastructure now that we've got. This is interesting just in terms of, of contrasts that are made now regarding user behavior. Um, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I sit down with a very instrumental goal in my browsing or, or my video use. Like last night, I sat down and typed in net neutrality and started watching you know, YouTube videos, thinking, well, what could I show? And, I get to John Oliver, who's brilliant, but there's so many F-bombs in his piece on, on net neutrality, I can't show it, but I, I suggest you guys check it out, his, his, his show on net neutrality, very interesting. So sometimes I'll be, you know, instrumentally looking for something, and sometimes ritualistically, you know, uh, I'll, when I get a chance to sit down and relax, I'll open up the New York Times or some place that I go to constantly without knowing what's going to be there, but I just so ritualistically sit down and go to my sites. I mean, one thing to check out for yourselves, I guess, and think about what, what you do with, with uh, you know, the way you work with the internet now that it's so interactive. I mean, do you go all over the place or do you stay on a few sites that you return to over and over again? Like if, if we said tomorrow, you can only go to like a dozen, uh, let's say a dozen places on the internet. I'm, I'm all for limiting you. Throw, leave that medium aside for a day. But now I'm saying like, just what if we limited you to 12 sites on the internet or something? How, how much would that curtail what you do on the internet? Not at all. Not much, not at all? Yeah. Yeah, when you think about it, you don't really go all that many different places unless you're going with search, right? And then search is basically whatever Google or whatever search engine you use, that's when you would like to feel that you can go anywhere, you know, that you have unfettered access. So, I mean, that's always interesting to me. So my ritualistic use, it really tends to focus on a few sites only, uh, whereas my instrumental use, which is driven by search, you know, I'd be dead without Google or with, you know, if I'm in YouTube, like searching for something, <coughs> then, you know, I'm basically depending on the search engine to, uh, to, to you know, give me a good image of what, what might be useful to me. You know? and that's where people start to worry about that. Um, so, so that's important. And, and you know, I, again, I've seen websites change over the last few years from, you know, very structured kind of linear sites where everything will be, you know, on a new site will be grouped by, you know, national, local, regional, uh, you know, just the way that old newspapers might have been laid. I've seen that explode on SFGate or wherever into uh, pages that are concocted clearly because someone will get there by search. You know, they're on, you know, whatever, they're on, on, uh, on, on Facebook. Someone says, hey, check this out. And rather than seeing 10 other stories on the same topic, they've now organized the content to, so that you land there, but you see something else that's going to be rated really highly and interesting that will lead you somewhere else, you know. So I've seen that whole structure change as, you know, search gives way to social recommendation as, as the, you know, the, the, the site selection of choice, you know. Now, I think it's all over the place. You can still get around through search, but a lot of people are getting around through recommendations. And that's changed the way that content is provided, you know. Um, the way that, uh, especially in news, people are talking a lot about news lately. So, so 
you know, the remaking of, of the news business, of the digitization of all of it and, and the structure that, um, that the web gives. So what do you think would be some of the advantages of, of uh, putting the news out on the web versus old media like television or print? Yeah, JP? Get the news anytime. Yeah, okay, so kind of anytime updates, Nika? And then get the specific news you want. Okay, so filtering kind of? Yeah, which is, that has its downside as well as its upside, right? Which was sort of my next question, too. Uh, and, and so, instantly updatable, uh, is there's also kind of limitless content, you know? I mean, it's really, you could, you could allow your site just to grow, and well, the New York Times is a great example of it. I mean, you know, it's, it's like, if it's not current on the site, you can search back to 1872 for everything they've published, you know, apparently, ever. So, you know, so, it's, so it's good. It's pretty cool. Yeah, because they're all just the, the old, yeah, just like all the old articles are just, cause some of them get really weird, but a lot of them are just, it's the same style of journalism. You can uh -huh. tell they've kind of had the same ethics throughout their entire, same usual writing style. It's pretty it's remarkable. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. And, and also you can get a PDF of the actual page, which is also interesting. So you're not just getting the, con the, 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 the item out of context, you can see it next to the advertising, you know, for mink coats or twelve ninety five or something like that. You know, it's like <laughs> crazy. <laughs> so, so you can see, you can kind of like look at the, you know, the the, the the array of things that are going on, you know, in nineteen forty two. It's it's really quite fascinating. So yeah, there's the the archiving part of it as well. If we got some time, I'd, I'd love to show you a, a video off of the New York Times uh, video pages. So, I mean, they're a multimedia uh, uh, publisher now. So that's another, I guess the other thing is that the web provides, you know, is it audio, is it video, is it you know, whatever you want. Yeah. yeah, it's all convergent. Yeah. And then the, uh, but, but, you know, obviously there's a lot of disadvantages to it as well, as, uh, as you started to like remark on as far as, you looking at it only if you have a certain perspective you want to get that kind of news but then it gets even more that it doesn't matter what the content is as long as the article is or the headline is clickbaity enough then we that's all that matters anymore and right and right content's just whatever you know and yeah so yeah and, and if we just if, get into where the ethics of journalism fall apart and now we're just not finding what's even remotely true or or not, we don't know anymore. It you got it. All mixed up. You got it. Yeah, sure. So there's there's a big downside to it, and and as Nika was saying, you you can see, you know, uh, an institution like the Times, which is trying to sustain its its ethical approach, is competing in a world where that doesn't matter. You know, so so I, you know, we I, I wouldn't say that that the ethic has just gone out the window, but it's just really hard to compete. Harder. Yeah, much harder. You know, and. Uh, and, and it, it, it often looks like old media versus new media as well, which is not necessarily the case. You know, there's a lot of, I mean, ProPublica in the news space, there's a lot of startups that are, you know, intensely ethical. Um, but it just tends to look like, you know, well, CBS is trying to convince, compete with BuzzFeed or something like that. And um, that's unfortunate because then it looks like, Ethics are, you know, a thing of the past, and everything that's new is kind of dedicated to just getting a maximum number of clicks. You know, and that's not really that's not really the case. But it, but you really have to, you know, know the field a bit for that. Corey, I think um, like some of the new forms of of like news, um, these companies uh, kind of putting out news through Facebook, kind of sometimes makes people disinterested because I, I'll be on KTVU. Or I'll be on Facebook and I'll get an update. KTV's sharing a live video, and it's just showing this like crowd of people, and everyone's like, "What's going on? What's going on?" And it's like silent for about five minutes, and they don't because KTV doesn't even really know what's going on. <laughs> okay. So it's like they're putting it out there okay. faster to, to think they're drawing you in, but in reality, I'm just disinterested. I'm like, okay, fine, I'll just see it on the ten o'clock news later. That's interesting. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so the draw, the draw of pure immediacy, like it has its limits. That's well, kind of what yeah, you're saying. If it's they like, came on and were like, "Hey, this is what's going on. You know, we're here. You know, we're trying to figure it out too." But yeah, it just, just takes way more manpower in producing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In part, also, I mean, only certain stories have the magnitude where we really need to be there. Versus, I'd rather get, like you're saying, the digest at 10 and 10 p.m. when they know what was happening. Yeah. Exactly. But uh, there's something called archive.org. You know, you must you must know all of it. So there's 
They have 24-7, uh, uh, about a half dozen channels uh, from the, the day of the 9-11 the attacks to the uh, seven days afterwards. You can see, you can you know, flip over, you can see what Univision was doing for the entire week, 24-7 or ABC or whatever. It's pretty fascinating. Like, you, you know, hit up the CNN, uh, 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 you know, whatever, stream from, you know, when it's happening. And they don't have a clue of what's going on. You know, the second plane hits, and you just hear people go, "Oh my God!" You know, and then it's like, "Well, we think a second plane has crashed into the tower, and we're thinking this might be a terrorist attack now." Or something. It's like, yeah, they can't "Oh my God!" There's no way. Yeah, and then and then they're they're phoning down to someone who's like, you know, I don't know, half a mile away from it, who's a CNN executive or something that they're talking to. It's like, you know, just just you're you're so unaccustomed to actually getting the undigested news that when you see it, it's like, wow, nobody knows what's going on until they have a chance to go through the whole journalistic thing. So I think, I mean, the latest thing is like live, live stream through YouTube or through Facebook, but it's not always all that informative, you know, but it's very experiential. Do you think there's a kind of a propagandistic angle to that too, in the sense that if you're down there in the street, you're, you're getting a very immediate picture, but is it, do you have the same hope for you know, objectivity or context at that point. I mean, I mean, with some with a lot of the protests recently, you know, the the news kind of it seems like they portray one group a certain way, another group another way, or they'll just show a bunch of people with you know bandanas around their face, and that automatically just scares people. Uh -huh. So if I, you know, as like if I was an older lady watching the news and I just see a bunch of people with black bandanas on them, oh, that's terrifying. Who are these people? Get them out of here. Mm -hmm. When in reality, they can be people fighting for social change, fighting against hate crimes and things like that. Yeah, they yeah. do market so. those, those Antifa lefties, yeah, yeah, right. That's, that's the, yeah, it's interesting. You enter into the media, you're a performer, and you're basically, you know, you're performing no matter what you do. Uh, I guess you have to really try to think out how, how your your representation is going to be used, but it's almost impossible because there's so many ways of, yeah. of using it. You know? uh, well, these are all interesting considerations. So, and, and you know, I think early on in the migration of news and video to the web, there was you know a lot a lot of the characteristics we thought were just going to be kind of un un. Uh, unambiguously positive, you know, oh, we can, you know, there, there'll no longer be any news filtering. I think we still probably all enjoy being able to go to the press outside of our country and seeing what they say. You know, I, I still think, you know, going, going to a top quality news site outside of the country or even Al Jazeera, when they were actually functioning, that was a real trip. To, I don't know, did anyone ever go to like to the Al Jazeera channel on YouTube yeah, or whatever? Yeah, they were pretty good. Right. Yeah. I mean, they were certainly different, you know. I mean, I, I think they satisfied people who wanted to feel like they were getting a different take on things sometimes, you know. And they were certainly, you know, reporting with um, using the same set of protocols that uh, the Western media would, you know, fact checking and getting sources and stuff. So it felt pretty solid. Um, uh, yeah, Richard? I feel like um, the social media that we get right now is mostly based on just American news. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now that the world is small, and almost right. everybody knows about the world, I feel like if the news finds a way to get the world news, along with American news, infuse it and make it into what it really is, what mm. it really is, I think that will be more appealing to me, instead of just focusing on American news, because everything is definitely related, for sure. Gotcha. And if we search, like, small Google search we can we can find it for sure so yeah yeah so so you you would prefer that your news feed was had like more of a diversity of yeah. news sources when it came and, and a worldly view a worldly view yeah but of course so much of that depends on you know your location I think, right? your location and the people that you're following or friending or whatever right I mean that, yeah, but, I mean, that controls so much of it I can sit in this corner of the world and know everything about other, that's that's what basically yeah. giving us. Why not use it in that way? You know, gotcha. It's basically free information. Why not provide that information? Maybe gain people who is 21, 24, 25 into it so that you know, 
instead of going on Facebook and Snapchat. Yeah. No yeah. Something else. Gosh, yeah. So, so uh, that probably you could, you know, probably when you are, I mean, you're using search to, to access other sites outside, but maybe it's not showing up in your news feed. And I guess the thought is you're more actively seeking out that kind of content. People are just sitting on, on Facebook and checking it out. Corey? It's funny, I, I, when I see other uh, news um, outlets from around the world, some of them do actually report on like more worldly things. Like I was watching uh, BBC America News, and they have they talk about America. They talk about things happening in Israel, uh, France. You know, pretty yeah. much as a global scale. But when you look at American news, it's all right here. Yeah, I go out and say, oh, this happened. You know, a helicopter of ours went down and over in you know wherever we're fighting now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Got gotcha. you. Sure. It's it's more it's more you know, centered on U.S. interests. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I do feel that when I watch European news as well. It's, it's because of its geolocation, it's, it's got a different set of priorities. And yeah, again, who knows, you know, the, the whole immigration patterns are radically different in Europe, uh, you know, even not just now in the last couple of years where it's like being huge, the amount of displaced people. But, you know, I mean, Germany's had for decades like tons of Turkish immigrants and France has had tons of Algerian, Moroccan, you know, and so that definitely is going to influence the coverage too. Yeah, it makes a difference. So, uh, yeah, it's it's pretty fascinating. And again, we can we can thank the internet for having those inputs. But um, you know, I guess I guess the period where everyone was like super, super, just uh, uh, kind of like uh, very. Utopian about the about the possibilities has passed, but I do remember. I mean, I was driving here this morning, thinking about like maybe 15 years ago, interviewing this guy, this author named Howard Rheingold, who lives in Mill Valley. He wrote a book called Virtual Community, and it was all about how online communities were going to like, you know, change change social interaction and. You know, he had chapters about people like, you know, with sick kids reaching out in the middle of the night and getting medical advice and stuff. And, I mean, I just cannot believe that in, in 15 years that is such an antiquity. You know, this thing called The Well, which was a, 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 a Bay Area kind of like uh, chat room type of thing, you know. It's like, now you got Facebook. <laughs> it's like, it's global. And it's just it's like a decade, no more. You know, and I remember sitting in his room, uh, you know, like recording him for a radio interview. Was just like, <laughs> that was the latest thing, you know, and I was thinking of doing my PhD on virtual communities. And stuff. It's like incredible. Gosh, well, we're all, I mean, just trying to get through some <laughs> more slides and stuff. But we're, we're, I think many people in this room, from what I gather from your, uh, from your um, stuff that you wrote, are cord cutters. Uh, cord nevers that's basically lost to the cable industry coming up except that we're clients of ISPs internet service providers so that, that is uh, uh, at one cord that we can't cut yet although it might be a wireless cord <laughs> at some point for sure um, let's see where else are we going with this Okay, so we talked about news there. Okay, privacy. Privacy we wanted. So last class we, we shared a little, uh, a little personal experience regarding cookies and how, you know, those cause targeted advertisements to appear in our browsers. Um, data collection, which we touched on as well, uh, a little bit anyway, but just uh, in the news recently, and here we're touching on, uh, Olive was asking a little bit more about the, the policy and legal framework that is governing, governing some of this, and it, there's, there's a lot of issues. But uh, I don't know if you remember it, within the last year uh, that um, Congress has rolled back privacy protections that the Obama uh, uh, administration tried to promote, uh, where an internet service provider like a Comcast um, had to ask your permission before reselling the data that they collect on all of your browsing and stuff. And so uh, Obama had, uh, had um, pushed that into, into law, and Congress rolled it back recently. 
So basically it was allowing the ISPs to sell your data based on your, your browsing uh, history. And I think in part that was also, um, in a depressing way, it turned out not to be so much of an issue because there are so many other places where your data is being gathered already that your ISP, you know, was, was uh, maybe the advantage that they had was that they could monitor your tablet use, your laptop use, and, you know, your video streaming. Or, so they, they probably could gather more of a picture of you than other providers could gather your cell provider, for instance, who may not have as much on you. <laughs> so, but it's just like basically so many people have a piece of so much of your data that, uh, that restricting ISPs was kind of like, well, you know, it's like this is not the end of the world if we release that. So um, that's, that's been a development recently. Uh, the, other, the other one, and well, I mean, do we have time here? Uh, this, this item here reminded me of some interesting story that at the risk of squandering some of our time, but I just find it really interesting to, uh, hi folks, uh, just to take a look at, yeah, a podcast that I follow had a very interesting story. Um, it, it, it explores the culture wars in the, in the U.S. and uh, a lot of it is, you know, around uh, um, conflicts over policing, over race, uh, over, over and political conflicts. I mean, but it explores a bunch of different things. But this particular episode uh, uh, featured a number of stories about um, alt-right alt -right provocation in the media. But this one was real interesting in terms of violations of privacy and some of the things that go on online. This was pretty cool. So hopefully I get it right. Burning crosses. The tactics are different these days. And the best way to start explaining all of this is to tell you a story about a guy named Ben Garrison. I reached him by phone in the wilds of Montana. Hey, Ben. How is life in Montana? Oh, it's great. You know, we live... Um... We live in a little town, a nearby little town. It's kind of like Mayberry. You know, everybody waves to each other. There's no traffic. There's no traffic light cameras getting ready to give you a ticket every turn. Ben's a staunch libertarian, a Rand Paul kind of guy. He says he used to be more liberal, or rather, he put on a liberal act back when he lived in Seattle and drew cartoons for daily newspapers. But in 2008, with the newspaper market shrinking, he escaped the city. That was right before the world economy collapsed. You know, the banker bailout thing really bothered me, and I thought, what can I do besides vote? Voting doesn't seem to work. So I said, well, I'm going to draw some protest cartoons, and I drew the first one in the summer of 2009. He sent them around to newspapers and mostly got ignored. Only one editor even bothered to respond. But I could tell he thought I was some kind of nut job. And then he realized, hey, this is 2009. Who needs newspapers? I had the bright idea. Well, I'm going to put it on the Internet. You know, the Internet, I don't have an editor. I don't have anybody telling me what I can't do. Well, what a great thing. What could go wrong? <laughs> well, everything went wrong. He's still not clear exactly how the trouble began. But he figures two things were important. One, as a conservative cartoonist, he was a very rare breed. And two, he was a total nobody. He had only one big hit, a cartoon called The March of Tyranny. In that one, a big, ominous pyramid representing the Federal Reserve hovers above some storm clouds. Below the clouds, you see two legs, a red Republican leg and a blue Democrat leg. And they're marching along, kicking the voters. A bipartisan march of tyranny on behalf of the evil money changers. Ben's timing with this cartoon was perfect, right as the Tea Party was kicking down the Republican establishment's door in 2010. It went viral. It was seen all over the world, and I started getting email from people all over the world. It was translated, somebody in Spain translated into Spanish. But then something weird happened. Ben started getting hate mail at his site, like lots of it. And people accused him of promoting some pretty extreme stuff, ideas that he did not support. I, I didn't know where this was coming from, and I was busy with some assignments at the time, so my wife, Tina, she did some searching and found out it all went back to this board called 4chan. I never heard of it, but when I looked at the board and saw, saw what they were doing, I was like, I was like incredulous. Somebody had stolen his artwork and changed it to turn it into neo-Nazi propaganda. 
They inserted anti-Semitic slurs. They turned the evil bankers into anti-Semitic caricatures. And they even created a whole fake biography for the artist, a whole new Ben Garrison, a Nazi instead of a libertarian. It all spread like wildfire. Somebody even killed Ben off and wrote him up as a kind of hate speech martyr. So I was reading my obituary. I was reading these fantastic stories about me being a Vietnam vet who liked to, you know, kill the enemy and then cut off their ears and put them on necklaces. So it was kind of Nazi hagiography, like they were they were sort of turning you into a Nazi hero. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly what they did. So they created this evil doppelganger, Ben, and they called him Zyklon Ben, because (laughs) my job in life was to uh, murder Jews and murder blacks and, you know, basically murder anybody who wasn't white and anybody who wasn't a Nazi, I was going to kill them. This went on for years, but things got really bad right about 2014. There were multiple fake Facebook profiles, fake Twitter accounts, and fake photos of him posing in Nazi uniforms. He says someone even threatened an art gallery where he was showing his commercial work. The owner closed the show as a result. Ben blames one person for all of this, a young man named Andrew Anglin. He's um, an arch troll, and I don't want people, I don't like to see him get undue publicity. But he is kind of emblematic of a lot of things that are going on on the Internet these days with this trolling uh, stuff. Andrew claims that he could marshal his troll army and go after whatever target he wants. And I was one of his targets because Andrew Anglin felt like I should be a Nazi, too. So, Andrew Anglin, who is he and where did he get an army of trolls? Nobody has a clue how Andrew Anglin became the most red white supremacist, really, neo-Nazi site on the web. That's Heidi Byrich again. She says when Anglin launched his website called The Daily Stormer, he was like Garrison, a total unknown. And he's a young guy, you know, maybe 30 years old. Um, He came out of nowhere. All right. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt that. But check this out if you want. It's called The uh, the United States of Anxiety. uh, What are you thinking, Nika? Ben Garrison's more recent stuff definitely has, like, he... There's definitely a lot more subtle anti-Semitism in his work now. Hmm. He's not completely outwardly anti-Semitic like the fake ones, but there's definitely some stuff in there. Okay. What's in now? Oh, so you feel that it wasn't entirely like unmotivated yeah. that, that they took him over. Yeah. <coughs> Interesting. Because that, that cartoon that we saw, uh, you know, it appeared to be both, you know, I mean, Republicans and Democrats were being crushed by the big bankers. And yeah, he, he's gotten a lot more right in recent years. Interesting. And his cartoons have only gotten more ridiculous and funny. But, uh, Interesting. Yeah. Ah, so there's more to this than even that. Okay, that's very cool. Well, follow it up if you're interested in that. I, I just, uh, I, I thought of it as I was thinking about, you know, uh, what, what, what kind of extreme stories have I seen about people's privacy and their image being appropriated and stuff. So. That happens like all the time. Is that right? Like, they just leak people's private information. Uh, they, they dox you, which is where they find all your private information, your address. It's all out they there. put it out all online. Fun. There was, like, a notorious situation involving Shia LaBeouf on there where they kept trying to find him, I think, because he was live streaming himself in certain places. They okay. They kept finding where he was. Oh, okay. So, like, he was sending out a live stream, but he wouldn't let you know necessarily where he was? Oh, and then, so did people, like, go and visit him and based on that? Or they, like, went to the spot where he was um, taking pictures from or something like that. Interesting. And then it ended up with them, like, take... Or no, I think he set up cameras, and then the last time was when they set up a camera, and they found, like, one of them, and they put a flag of Pepe the Frog, like, in front of the camera. <laughs> Oh, my God. Okay. All right. Um, last, last issue we could look at here. This one's a little bit. Net neutrality. It's a seemingly complicated hot-button term, but it's actually based on a pretty simple philosophy, that everything on the Internet should be treated equally. Broadband providers shouldn't be able to decide which websites to block or to slow down. Let's look at an example. I pay for cable and Internet through a service provider. So when I go online, I expect to be able to watch all the goat videos my heart desires. And when I go on Netflix, I expect to be able to binge House of Cards without any interruptions in service. 
But without net neutrality, there's nothing stopping my service provider from simply blocking websites or slowing down the streaming speeds of websites, like Netflix. And it's already happened. In 2007, Verizon blocked text messages from a pro-choice abortion rights group. Verizon said they had the right to prevent consumers' access to any groups the company might deem controversial or unsavory, though they quickly backtracked. And just last year, Comcast slowed Netflix's streaming speeds until Netflix paid for smoother streaming. Netflix accounts for more than 30% of internet streaming, and Comcast believed that they should be accountable for some of the infrastructure upgrade costs. In February, when Netflix paid up, speeds went back up, as you can see here in the red line. Here's an analogy. Let's say FedEx wants Amazon to give them money because Amazon packages take up a large portion of their shipments, and FedEx thinks that they should chip in for their truck repairs. To pressure Amazon, FedEx slows down their delivery time, but the consumer is the one who paid for the two-day shipping in the first place, and the consumer is the one hurt by having her packages delayed. The FCC wants to establish clear rules to make sure that broadband providers can't do this. They plan to define the internet providers as common carriers under Title II of the Communications Act. Companies regulated under Title II can't discriminate what services they're providing to the consumer. It's why FedEx can't discriminate against Amazon deliveries. Democrats and President Obama strongly support these regulations. Many Republicans in the broadband industry see it as more unnecessary government oversight. They worry the regulations will prevent innovation and growth. The thinking goes, if AT&T and Comcast are required to let anyone use their lines for free, why would they spend billions of dollars building them in the first place? They also see the free market as a solution. If you don't like Comcast slowing your Netflix, switch to Verizon. The sticking point there is the majority of American consumers currently only have one provider of high-speed internet service to choose from. The debate will likely continue after the FCC rules on this February 26th. So the latest news I've been able to find on this issue is that uh, there's a new FCC chairman named Ajit Pai uh, who doesn't uh, see this the way that the Obama uh, administration did, of course. Uh, and so uh, there's, been, there's, there's been a back and forth about how to regulate the internet. Should it be considered the common carrier, which is what the document that was shown to us in the video uh, is related to. So there are, you know, there's a, there's a rationale for the government being able to regulate common carriers in the sense that they're providing essential services and so the government should be involved in making sure that uh, they do a good and fair job of it. So for instance, the telephone uh, company is uh, regulated under the common carrier rules, the idea that they're not going to charge you something different than they would charge somebody sitting next to you to make a phone call or something. They're not going to get involved in, in that. And the idea is that you want a, a telephone infrastructure that just works fairly for everybody. Uh, the, uh, if you don't consider the internet as something akin to a common carrier, uh, you have much less of, a, of a, a, an established authority to regulate. And uh, Ajit Pai has gone on record, this is not all voted yet as policy from the FCC, but Ajit Pai himself, as a chairman anyway, has said that he feels that um, you know, it's, it's extreme to call the internet a common carrier, that industry can do uh, an adequate job uh, of, of um, uh, making sure that, uh, that, you know, that, that the internet treats all information providers equally. And uh, rather than regulate in advance of any bad things happening, uh, which is the idea that if, if they're a common carrier, you create all these rules, everyone has to obey all these rules, and then you go and enforce them. You could also take the position that the industry will you know, uh, act in its best interest and in the interest of the consumers. And then if something goes wrong, you can come in and try to clean that up afterwards. And you don't need to have this you know, set of rules around uh, of the internet as a common carrier. carrier. So uh, although none of this is finalized yet, that's the current state of net neutrality. It seems like the FCC and the new chairman who's been appointed by the, the Trump administration is leaning more towards the industry taking care of this uh, and, uh, and, and not a lot of government regulation of it. Still with the idea that if something goes wrong, they, they can step in and you know, break it up and, and fix it if necessary. 
that's 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 the the idea we are at with net neutrality. And by the way, the whole story that's told about Comcast slowing down Netflix, uh, it sounds like Netflix just made a payoff, wrote a check to Comcast, and then they turned it up. But apparently, what Netflix did was install servers, internet servers. Uh, closer to where their clients are so that Comcast didn't have to do so much heavy lifting of, of taking the, you know, someone, someone in the middle of the country wants to stream a, a video and it has to be carried all the way from a server in God knows where. They located their libraries closer, which reduced a lot of the, the loads on the ISPs. So it sounds like, you know, it was like virtually extortion, like write me a check or I'll slow everything down. Whereas in fact, the investment that Netflix made was you know, hardware to make things run better. And Gino, did you want to say something about it? Uh, yeah, um, I kind of noticed how, like with Comcast, um, I've seen some offers where they kind of package Netflix with Comcast. Yeah, interesting, okay. Yeah, I haven't noticed that, but Comcast has their own library because they're owned by NBC Universal, right? Or they're, right, right. they're, they're together. So they have the whole NBC Universal catalog that they don't have to pay anything to stream. Plus, they provide other stuff that they go out like. So, so Comcast has a competing service. I don't know what it's called, but it has a competing streaming service. So it'd be interesting if they also bundle Netflix yeah, down they, too. Uh, you know, like when I was at cable, you can log in to your Facebook or your Netflix account through your cable box. Okay. So that way you didn't have to use so it's like they basically have a Netflix app in store installed on the cable box yeah, that they provide. Starbucks. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, there's so much complexity in all this stuff. Uh, it's, who knows? But anyway, I don't think the story about uh, Comcast and Netflix is, is all that <laughs> deeply described there. All right, uh, a cahoot. I don't know if we've really uh, come close to covering what might be in the cahoot. But, uh, <laughs> if you're interested, yeah, let's see. And. Uh, you know, if it's if it's all news to uh, if it's all news to you, well, at least you've seen some questions, and we'll be reviewing all of this, of course. Ready to join? Sure thing. Guy Fieri. All right. We'll assume that those who want to play are in there. Are you ready? All right. Who's the father of the internet? Al Gore. <laughs> we got six players, right? Okay. Yes. And Surf was the answer. Okay. And the internet is a packet switch network. True or false, guys? And so it is a packet switch network. It was true. All right. There we go. Some kind of viewing is when we use the net out of habit without a clear goal. What would we call that? It is ritualistic is the answer. I wonder why maybe someone else just joined. So ritualistic viewing is when you just go by habit. All right, online data is limited, but speed in the, on the internet is controlled by what? I'm going to skip through it. Oh, okay. Well, four, four people got bandwidth is the correct answer. So a broadband connection will get you faster data delivery. All right. And next up, what type of app helps you surf the web? All right, we're going to skip ahead again. It's the browser. Everybody got that, right? Cool. All right. How much do webcasters pay in royalty fees? <laughs> Oh, um, wow. so internet radio, they're paying 0 0.07 cents per listener per song. All right, good job, guys. Streaming technology does what? Streaming pushes a continuous flow of data through the internet. Question eight, short episodes on YouTube shows are called webisodes, right? Let's get that true. Yes, and remember, the web is great for news because... Uh, so all of these would have been right except for the green one and nobody took the green one. Totally reliable information. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for playing. All right, get the results. Yeah, Guy Fieri. Guy Fieri <laughs> pulls it out. All right. Good job, guys. Have a good weekend. And next week, mobile. See you there.